I hope uh, you had a nice break and you're enjoying the, uh, the chance to network. Uh, we're going to get into the final panel discussion for the day now. And this session is focused on geopolitics and human security. Uh, I probably don't need to remind everybody anymore uh, that you can submit Slido questions. I think that's, that's uh, caught on, that message. But uh, please do, do that um, for this session as well. Our moderator for this panel is Professor Robert Patman. Robert is one of the University of Otago's inaugural sesquicentennial distinguished chairs and professor of international relations. He previously served as an editor for the scholarly journal International Studies Perspectives and as head of Department of Politics. Robert's research interests encompass US foreign policy, international relations, global security, great power relations, and the Horn of Africa. He is a Fulbright Senior Scholar, an Honorary Professor of the New Zealand Defence Command and Staff College, and provides regular contributions to the national and international media on global issues and events. Please join me in welcoming Professor Robert Patman. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, Tenakoto Couture. Um, We've got uh, four excellent speakers this afternoon. I'm very excited about this session, and in many respects, it draws on threads that we've heard throughout the day. And uh, the we're looking at the relationship between geopolitics and human security. Um, I think it might be just a useful preliminary to define both of those terms in just very outlined terms, so that we're very clear on these terms. Geopolitics is an approach to foreign policy analysis which seeks to understand, explain, and predict international political behavior primarily in terms of geographical variables such as location, size, climate, uh, demography, natural resources, technological development, and, and so on. Political identity and activities are thus seen as more or less def defined by geography. Now that's not a watertight definition, it's just meant to give an understanding and geopolitics is often under equated with an approach to international politics, which is often broadly called realism. And the Prime Minister alluded this morning about how there was a need to shift um, what has sometimes been a dominant approach in international relations. She spoke about the need after the COVID experiences that the need that we can't go on as before, that we need to think in terms of uh, enlightened self-interest, uh, that there is a need, there's a self-interest now for international cooperation, rather than seeking uh, partisan uh, gains through a sort of zero-sum approach to international relations. Um, we're also going to look at the relationship between geopolitics and human security. Now, the concept of human security is relatively recent. It emerged out of the 1994 United Nations Development Program. Um, the UNDP, which proposed a shift in focus away from military security to human security. Uh, human security is not just concerned with the military interactions of sovereign states or a preoccupation with the possession of weapons. Uh, amongst other things, the 1994 Human Development Report outlined seven areas of human security. These included economic security, food security, an issue which is of considerable concern in the Indo-Pacific region, which uh, Professor Michael Baker alluded to as a result of the uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis. Health security, environmental security, personal security, community security, and political security. In short, uh, human security is an attempt, is a much more holistic approach to security, uh, which attempts to look at not just um, if you like, rivalries in international politics, but some of the underlying causes of rivalries, uh, and these may be economic and social. Um, there's a number of issues that I think that we're going to cover in this session, um, but I, what I would like to do at this point is introduce our first speaker. And uh, each of our speakers uh, will have five minutes, and then I propose, once each speaker has delivered their presentations, to open it up to questions, and I'm sure that uh, what they've got to say will provoke uh, and stimulate a lot of questions. So the first speaker is Dr. Oriana Skylaw Mastro. Um, Dr. Mastro is a center fellow at the Freeman Sproglai Institute for International Studies at Stanford University, where her research focuses on Chinese military and security policy, 
Asia-Pacific security issues, war termination and coercive diplomacy. Please extend a very warm welcome uh, to Dr. Mastro. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm actually calling you from Sydney, Australia, uh, instead of Stanford, California, but I came here to escape lockdown, and yet now I find myself in lockdown again. <laughs> so I'm not sure what that tells you about me as a strategist, but at least I was smart enough to escape the United States about a year ago, um, but not smart enough to make it back to the States before this lockdown occurred. As was mentioned in my bio, I work primarily on military issues. So in my five minutes today, I want to give an overview of how the military situation in the Asia Pacific has significantly changed in the past 18 months. I work primarily on China military uh, and security issues and, and Chinese military modernization. I myself speak Chinese uh, before COVID times. I very much enjoyed spending time in China to discuss these issues with my Chinese colleagues, uh, Chinese military officials and government officials as well. I recently wrote an article uh, called The Taiwan Temptation and the newest issue of Foreign Affairs in which I argue that China is moving away from peace war unification and is more seriously considering uh, what they call armed reunification with Taiwan. I don't make this argument lightly, and I wouldn't have made this argument two years ago, but a lot of things have changed in the past 18 months that make me think that there's a real, real possibility for conventional limited conflict in Asia, which would of course have a significant effect on all countries in the region, regardless of their degree of direct involvement. Chinese rhetoric on Taiwan has changed. Uh, I think if you look at Xi Jinping and what he has been saying about Taiwan, it suggests that he is dissatisfied with where things are. It's no longer enough to prevent independence. I think they need to see progress towards reunification. And uh, a lot of people sort of argue, well, you know, can't they just wait forever? You know, my viewpoint is unless Chinese boots are on the ground in Taiwan, China cannot have full political control uh, of the island. And I don't see full political control happening through peaceful means. And I think the Chinese leadership feels the same way. Now, of course, there's still people in China that argue uh, that it's better to wait. Uh, some of my Chinese colleagues in response to my argument have said that um, not that I'm wrong, but they would say maybe I would be more I would be I, I would be more right in about four years from now. So we have a timeline uh, disagreement, but not necessarily a disagreement about the, the change in the situation there. Besides the rhetoric and, and more and more, there's an open debate in China about whether uh, uh, peace war unification is working. Most say no. Uh, there's a lot of articles that talk about what armed reunification would look like. But of course, the discourse isn't as powerful as what I see happening actually with the military on the ground. Xi Jinping instituted a military modernization program in 2013 with a great sense of urgency, primarily designed to strengthen the Chinese military's capabilities to conduct joint operations in particular, the types of operations needed to take Taiwan by force. Large components of that program came to a successful end last year. And that's why we saw for the first time in, in a long time, China changing some of its um, national strategic guidelines to say that uh, they're now preparing for joint military operations that occurred in November, 2020. So it's not surprising to me, and of course I'm biased as a military strategist, I focus on military issues, but it's never surprising to me that countries become more assertive when they have more capabilities to actually pursue their objectives. In 2009, when China became more assertive at the South China Sea, this was not surprising to me because this is the first time they had naval capabilities that could actually patrol those waters. You know, Before that, they couldn't go that far from their coastline, so they weren't as assertive with their military capabilities because they couldn't physically get there. If you looked 15 years ago, you know, before China, even 10 years ago, they didn't have air-to-air -air refueling. They couldn't physically be so present, so active, and they could never even consider the types of operations I'm talking about. So of course, now that a lot of these capabilities have come online, 
And I'm happy in the, in the Q&A to go into much more specifics for those that are interested in the four main campaigns that China is planning to take Taiwan by force. But now that those capabilities have come online, I do think there is a temptation to use them. If the Chinese uh, think that they can successfully uh, gain control of Taiwan, they might do so. The last component I'll just conclude with because of my limited time is an assessment of cost. And this is really where countries like New Zealand come in. I don't think there's any real expectation. And I'm saying this from my personal perspective. I do not speak uh, on behalf of, of any institutions of which uh, I am a part. My personal perspective is I don't think there is much of an expectation that a country like New Zealand would be actively involved in this conflict if it were to occur. The Chinese would not risk their national rejuvenation to initiate a conflict uh, over Taiwan. Of course, if Taiwan declared independence tomorrow, you know that's a different story, but I'm talking about a proactive initiation. In my article on foreign affairs, however, I lay out why the Chinese leadership most likely thinks that there's not going to be huge costs, economic or international, associated with their use of force against Taiwan. A lot of people have pushed back to say, if there were these costs, if there were a counterinsurgency, if countries were to uh, you know, cut off their diplomatic ties with China in the aftermath of, of such a use of force, et cetera, et cetera, China would not take Taiwan. And I completely agree. I just don't see those dynamics in play. So the question is, if, if, if um, middle powers like New Zealand are not considering active military involvement in some of the possible territorial disputes that are ongoing between China and, and many of its neighbors, of which the Taiwan issue is only one, uh, what should be the policy in order to enhance uh, the resiliency of New Zealand in the face of a possible conflict uh, and to try to enhance deterrence through other means uh, to show China that use of force would be costly, uh, at least in the political and e in economic realms if not in the military realm. So I look forward to our discussion today to open this up, um, to see the types of things that, that we can uh, brainstorm. It's a real pleasure uh, to be in the region. I hope uh, to, to actually visit your country in September. So uh, fingers crossed, um, we, op we open up this travel bubble and I get to engage more and learn more from your perspectives then. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oriana. <clears throat> Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce our second speaker, Nguyen Kak Jiang. Um, Jiang is currently a PhD candidate at Victoria University of Wellington, where he uh, compares the Vietnamese and Chinese political developments. He was formerly head of the political research unit of the Hanoi-based Vietnam Institute for Economic and Policy Research. Please extend a warm welcome. for a very interesting uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I would... It's going now? Yep. I guess, sorry. Um, many thanks, Robert, and many thanks, Dr. Mastro, for a very interesting uh, presentation, uh, discussion on China. And I would like to move a little bit southward to the region of Southeast Asia and ASEAN specifically. Uh, in this morning uh, discussion on geopolitical uh, situations in, in, in the Southeast Asia, uh, Asia region, uh, there was a very interesting questions on uh, how New Zealand engaged uh, more with the region without you know, increasing military uh, defense uh, expenditure. And uh, this is a very interesting question, and this actually uh, reflects a very common uh, position on uh, you know when people talk about uh, security challenges in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, normally most think of the um, traditional intrastate uh, tensions or conflict, you know, uh, mostly because of the South China Sea conflict. But I think a more significant issue that would need to have more attention is the non-traditional uh, challenges that are having real and more much more profound impacts on the life of uh, Southeast Asian people, uh, whether it is the you know the ongoing. Uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, or whether we, uh, it is the uh, national disasters that happen every year from Indonesia, Philippines to Vietnam, or uh, whether it's water management, the Mekong River, or whether it's human rights uh, violations that are happening uh, in Myanmar. Um, all, these, all these issues actually can be considered as uh, transnational ones. Uh, 
or should be considered as such because some problems like the Rohingya crisis in Myanmar, for example, uh, has a potential spillover effect uh, that can affect the whole region. But as we see ASEAN as the uh, collective representation of uh, Southeast Asian countries, uh, actually has failed to address those issues efficiently. Um, some of the failures uh, we see, like climate change uh, or natural disaster reliefs, uh, is because of the lack of capacity and the expertise of ASEAN as the organization. But in some other issues, what I call the uh, sensitive non-traditional threats, uh, this actually reflects the inherent weakness of ASEAN's approach, you know, very passive approach and uh, consensus uh, base. And to some extent, it also reflects the political uh, deficit of ASEAN as a collective group of mostly authoritarian uh, states. Uh, ASEAN, for example, has failed to even criticize or, uh, you know, both the Rohingya crisis in 2017 and 18, and the coup uh, in Myanmar, uh, not to mention whether they can offer any realistic solutions to, uh, to the country's uh, problem. So I do believe that with uh, the uh, capacity and advantages of Australia and, and New Zealand, it is critical for, for both countries to uh, engage more with Southeast Asia in uh, both aspects of non-traditional uh, security challenges. Uh, for example, for, for some non-sensitive issues like um, pandemic control, both Australia and New Zealand have been excel and has been exemplars of dealing with, with the, the pandemic both in terms of prevention and, in the case of Australia, producing vaccines. And uh, I think because of that, uh, Australia and New Zealand could uh, provide much needed support to uh, the region in uh, controlling and in, you know, dealing with the pandemic, especially at the time now when Southeast Asian countries have been you know, struggling to, to deal with the, the fourth outbreaks of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic because of the Delta variants. Uh, even in some countries which has been doing quite well uh, in the first year like Vietnam, or in the closest Southeast Asian neighbor like Indonesia, where we've seen uh, 40,000 cases uh, per day and it's you know, on top of the world for not so, so good reason. I've seen uh, some reports of Australia providing vaccines to those uh, countries, so that's probably a very good sign. And uh, on a more long-term note on uh, sensitive non-traditional uh, security threats like human rights and democracy promotion, I believe that is beneficial for the you know, people of Southeast Asia uh, that Australia and, and New Zealand could uh, help address the democratic deficit in uh, the region. Um, there are many ways to do so, but first and foremost, I believe that uh, it is important for uh, both governments to engage more with the region's uh, part in civil society rather than that interacting with the states. Because it's worth remembering that uh, when we talk about ASEAN countries, none of them, those countries can be considered as a full democracy. And most, uh, most of them are probably one of the most, you know, some are the most notorious authoritarian regimes in the world. Uh, and when we talk about Southeast Asia, we talk about 700 uh, million people, and most of them are very young and very aspiring to democracy, and they would desire to have a future with uh, you know, uh, democracies like we have here in New Zealand or in Australia. And of course, there's a risk of you know, displacing uh, rulers uh, for that, but there are always subtle ways, uh, I believe, uh, for engagement. And uh, New Zealand, of course, should uh, stick to their values rather than that uh, short-term interest in the relationship with ASEAN states like what uh, Prime Minister Aden uh, said in the morning. And from my own experience uh, as a young Southeast Asian uh, person, I believe that Australia and New Zealand appeal to the people of Southeast Asia, not just because of the advanced economy or the beautiful landscape, but uh, because of the uh, democratic and equitable societies that are very contradictory to what you know, the reality in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, so I believe that a more democratic Southeast Asia will guarantee a much better uh, opportunity for economic cooperation, as well as to improve the security of Australia and New Zealand. In the morning, we, uh, Prime Minister Arden uh, called the region as a wider home of, of New Zealand. And if that's the okay, case, I believe that promoting the values that Kiwis uh, enjoy here in a wider home in Southeast Asia would be, you know, should be prioritized uh, to make that home a better place. And uh, in my opinion, that would require a multi-stakeholder approach to foreign policy, as well as to require some real actions 
that, that, that few words or lip service. Thank you. Thank you, Shane. <laughs> I'd now like to introduce our third speaker, uh, Dr. Hong Li Tu. Uh, Dr. Hong Li Tu is Senior Analyst at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, ASPE, in Canberra. Um, she leads projects there on Southeast Asia, including on regional alignment politics, perceptions of great power competition, defense diplomacy, regional dispute management, particularly in the South China Sea, ASEAN regionalism, and Australia's engagement with the region. Please extend a very warm welcome to Dr. Tu. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can you hear me well? Yes. So um, in my five minutes, I'd like to talk about um, COVID in particular, because uh, COVID will really have an impact on the changing geopolitical landscape of the region, of the Indo-Pacific, uh, but also very much having a ve um, very impactful um, effect on human security. And I'll use examples of Southeast Asia in particular. I think in the beginning of the pandemic, um, most of the analysts saw COVID as uh, simply an accelerator of pre-existing trend rather than a game changer. Um, of trends such as the great power competition, decoupling, and so on and so forth. I took another look, um, I took another stance with it from the beginning because yes, COVID has accelerated many of the pre-existing trends, but also it slowed down many others. And it has complicated and continues to complicate many others. For example, Asia, if you look at Asia, Asia by and large it was on the trend of massive growth, economic growth. It was the story of the Asia, it, it's been a story of growth and successfully, uh, you know, a development um, and beating uh, poverty, reaching towards development goals. But at the moment, um, over a year after the pandemic, we are clearly seeing that COVID is delaying uh, the many of UN development goals. It has brought uh, many back under the poverty line, um, millions as estimations go in uh, develop, developing Asia. We had um, now challenges including food uh, security and food safety. We've got loss, massive loss of jobs um, and economies that have for decades grow at really impressive um, rate now are uh, it's either stagnation or a recession. Indonesia being one of the examples. So I think COVID really complicates everything um, on every level. The political fragility of the region, and I'm talking about Southeast Asia in particular, has been already um, uh, weak in, in many aspects. And COVID really exposed that, exposed the governance challenges that the region has had. Now, some of the countries are dealing, have de dealt with the, the first year of, of pandemic relatively well and Southeast Asia in comparative perspective with the globe uh, last year was tracking relatively well but um, as a new variant of Delta as my um, co-panelist also mentioned is really posing another wave of challenge and this is um, even more scary this time because first of all the delta variant is, is much more contagious but also the resilience is already weakened by over 18 months of, of uh, economic uh, complications from the first waves of COVID. So I do see many complications in the region that would affect the resilience of countries, their governance system, the economic models, as well as their ability um, in the defense uh, sector. Uh, so as Oriana said, the geopolitical trends are tracking along and actually the tensions are becoming more um, pronouncing the region, South China Sea being one example, Taiwan another. But the ability of the countries in the region to deal with those challenges will become even more limited now that they are weakened by this pandemic. Moreover, I think there is a parallel challenge 
of institutions that are not um, uh, standing up to uh, their tasks. I'm talking about multilateral institutions, including the UN agencies, but also the regional one, which is the Association of South Asian Nations. From the beginning, ASEAN has had many challenges. Um, one key challenge of ASEAN is to really actually do arriving at any common um, uh, stance in, in major security issues. And COVID pandemic was not an exception in this regard. I think countries have uh, learned to de deal with the pandemic on their own. First, with the border um, closures, with uh, PPEs, tests, and other uh, measures, and now with vaccines. So vaccines, um, every country in Southeast Asia are dealing have their own vaccine strategies. Uh, we don't we don't have yet you know a regional uh, policy that would support countries or um, help them with more equi equitable access. So really, the role of institutions uh, are weakened. And on top of all of that, there is the Myanmar crisis on, uh, unfolding, which really challenge ASEAN to its core. Uh, first of all, on the stability and security of the region, one of their key, uh, one of their member states. And second of all, that, uh, it only exposes that uh, diversity of opinions within the Southeast Asian nations. The views on how to response to Myanmar crisis are different within ASEAN and therefore the responses is protract. And I think um, it is fair to say that hopes that ASEAN will play central role in mediating this crisis uh, has been relatively diminished uh, by now. So really the countries in Southeast Asia have little option to fall onto. Their uh, own national governance uh, are being challenged. The institution of ASEAN is also um, lagging behind in, in responses. And uh, on top of that, there's ongoing great power competition that, it, that exerts further pressure on them, both diplomatically as well as economically, because the US-China competition uh, do, has, do affect the global supply chain and, and also economic systems. Um, so the region is facing multiple challenges at the same time, perhaps in a very content, concentrated, con uh, concentrated uh, period of time, in, in a period where state capabilities are um, uh, constrained and also distracted by uh, the unfolding pandemic. And I'm worried that the worst is yet to come. I think it's still going to be um, go, get worse before um, a more widespread vaccination is rolling, being rolling out in the region and will have a more sense of stabilization. I think for the, for the time being, the region is in a very vulnerable place. Um, and in debates in Australia and New Zealand about the Indo-Pacific become the secondary ones. I think at the moment, really what matters uh, in the first place is how countries are able to engage uh, and support in um, fighting the pandemic. I'll just give you one example um, of the region's view uh, on Australia and New Zealand in particular. For in uh, an annual uh, survey by the Institute of Southeast Asian uh, Studies, ISIS Yusuf Ishak Institute, my former employer, um, there, there was a, a question, which external power has provided most support to the region um, during the pandemic. Of course, the survey was taken uh, early in, uh, this year in January, so not all of uh, the support has been accounted for. But uh, the biggest uh, pool of response, over 44% of the 10 ASEAN countries uh, responded went to China. China was seen as the most uh, providing most support um, followed by Japan, EU with big lag in between, and uh, Australia and New Zealand very much, very much in behind. And uh, you might find it interesting that New Zealand got 4.7%, while Australia got only 4.3%, despite all the uh, announcement that Australia has, has made and pledged to, uh, to the region. Uh, but that shows 
to you that um, you know Australia and New Zealand are still being marginally seen as uh, supporting um, at the moment. Of course, uh, hopefully that will change with new um, uh, vaccines support uh, that both countries are pledging to the region. But the crisis is unfolding uh, very rapidly. So pledges that vaccines will arrive in mid 2022, uh, it's not going to cut it. I am going to uh, stop here because I'm aware that the time is, is um, up and I don't want to take over of my uh, second uh, next speaker, but I'm uh, happy to go into the question and um, answer sessions to discuss further. Thank you. Thank you too. <clears throat> Right, I've got my, my, to introduce my next speaker, it's a great pleasure to do so, uh, Dr. Rubin Steff, who is Senior Lecturer in International Relations at the University of Waikato. Uh, Rubin is, uh, he teaches courses on New Zealand foreign policy, international relations and global security. His academic research includes the implications of artificial intelligence for the global balance of power and small states, the intersection between nuclear deterrence theory, ballistic missile defense, and the security dilemma. He's also interested in New Zealand and US foreign policy and great power competition. Please extend a warm welcome. Am, am I on? Can you hear me? Yep, cool. Um, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, sorry I've broken the rule. I have two PowerPoint slides, um, and in a minute it'll be clear as to why I have these PowerPoint slides um, supporting my presentation today. But I guess, um, yeah, thematically, my presentation is more probably in line with Oriana's presentation than the other two, in that I'm not really going to talk much about human security. I'm going to talk much more about ge geopolitics and you know, hard security, so to speak. And I guess the talk is also informed by the fact that I think our foreign policy is in a period of potential instability um, and a bit of flux given everything that's going on in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, and we also in New Zealand, I think over the past months and maybe year or so have begun a, maybe a bit more of an intense debate about our foreign policy settings. And we're starting to walk up to the edge of some of the hard questions as it relates to our foreign policy. And today I'm gonna to push us a bit more over the edge into uh, thinking about what I think are some of the real tough, low likelihood, but very tough and serious military issues that could emerge in the region. Because I have today thought about Taiwan, the South China Seas, and the Korean Peninsula as three potential flashpoints, potential military crisis flashpoints. So uh, in a second, I'll indicate to the tech guys to go to the second uh, slide. But basically, you know, if any of these three flashpoints exploded into a crisis or a military conflict, I'm wondering, would New Zealand become involved? And what would our role be? And I don't have the answers to this. I don't know if anyone does in this room, but I'm going to go to a matrix. If you can go to the second slide now. So I have this matrix up here where I mo mocked it up pretty quickly, where I assumed if there was a military, major military outbreak as it pertains to Taiwan, South China Seas, or Korea, the US would be involved in some capacity. OK, so that's, that's assumption for all of this. And then I thought, okay, what if I have these different columns where I have a kind of a guesstimation about, you know, would, would there be a US, you know, UN Security Council mandated response set on the far left column? For two of them, I have no, because China, of course, would veto anything, obviously. Korea, maybe, depending upon how that played out, it might be the collapse of the state or some other domestic crisis that requires an intervention from outside. I have up there, you know, would a multinational coalition be involved? Would other states come to the US aid? And you see what I have there. Maybe South China Seas, I su suspect, yes, at least Southeast Asian states would be involved in that. Korean Peninsula, maybe. Threats to the rules-based system in all three cases, probably, right? Or at least the spirit of the rules-based system, depending upon how all three of these played out. If it was a, if Korea was just falling apart internally, well, maybe not, because of the entire world including China, the US, Japan, South Korea, the rest of us would be, want to get involved. Threat to New Zealand citizens in the region, well, you see what I have there, right? We have citizens in Taiwan, around Taiwan, ditto in South Korea, uh, South China Seas, well, that could just be a naval confrontation and our citizens wouldn't be threatened. Australia military intervention, Taiwan, I have maybe. South China Seas, I say lean likely. Korean Peninsula, I also say lean likely. 
And again, all of you may have different guesses and the ways you would code this, but this is just kind of my guesstimation for now, and it's a, it's a baseline perhaps for discussion and thinking about these issues. Threat to Australian territory, Taiwan, probably not, at least during the first order of any conflict there. Hopefully it wouldn't go any further. South China Seas, Korea, maybe. I mean, the North Korean regime has threatened Australia directly with its rhetoric before. Threat to New Zealand territory in all three cases, again, pro probably not, right? Maybe if after this conflict, it could lead to second order, third order consequences in which things could push down to the South Pacific. And here I'm really talking about the far reaches of things, right? Real worst case scenarios. The part of the, part of the thing of strategic studies that I'm involved in as an academic is to think through you know, the unthinkable, to think through difficult scenarios. New Zealand military intervention, okay. Coded in red. Taiwan, based upon what I heard from the PM today, the way she deflected the question, talked about Hong Kong, which would be very different to uh, invasion of Taiwan. Based upon what Oriana said and what is just my gut feeling, if there was a war over Taiwan in the imminent future, I don't think New Zealand would military get involved. May Maybe the scenarios, depending upon how it played out, we would play some support function, I don't know. But I'm just saying lean unlikely. South China Seas, I'm saying maybe. Korean Peninsula, well, lean likely. I think that'd be a situation where most countries would be working together to deal with that issue. Other contribution, right? Well, could we have other contributions, whether it be um, peacekeeping in the aftermath of one of these conflicts, uh, I don't know, aid, economic, strong diplomatic protests, well, you see what I have up there. So this is, <laughs> it is just something for discussion, debate, to start thinking through the prospects for all these, you know, still very low, I would think, for the foreseeable future and probably in the medium term, but they're not zero, and maybe they could grow over time. And I think we do need to start thinking through some of the hard questions related to these issues. We may not like to think about them and talk about them, but hey, um, that's, I have a salary, I think, that pays me to talk about these issues. We could also add other columns, like, you know, would there be domestic consent? Would the New Zealand population, would the majority uh, be, view New Zealand intervention as favourable or not? You could maybe have another column up there, like, does New Zealand even have a capability, a credible military capability, to contribute to any military um, contingency over these three flashpoints? So look, I'll leave it there. Those are my guesses. They could be changed. You may have different ways of coding that, but I thought it's a baseline for thinking about through some potentially difficult um, scenarios in the future. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ruben. <laughs> right, what I'd like to do now is uh, throw it open to the audience. Uh, we've had four excellent speakers, raised a lot of very interesting issues. Um, and may, just a housekeeping, on how you frame your digital questions, and I know some of you are already beginning to do this, but could you please indicate whether your question is for a specific member of the panel, or if it is not, indicate that it's a, a panel-wide question so that uh, it applies to all members of the panel. Thank you very much. So we seem to have quite a reticent audience at the moment. <laughs> well, well oh, oh, here we go. Okay. So the first question here, um, it's already been supported by 48 people or so. Uh, there were 48 thumbs. Uh, do, uh, Dr. Mastro, do you think if the US, EU, Japan, India, Australia, New Zealand moved to a two-China policy and officially recognized Taiwan's independence, that China would back down? So that's a question for you, Ariana. I think the short answer is no. That's how we get nuclear war. So I would not, I would not advise that. I mean, in general, right now, the discussion is that there are certain scenarios, conventional military scenarios, the United States could still lose to China in. But we talk about these conventional scenarios because if there's any situation in which China escalated it to sort of major protracted war, nuclear war. I don't think the United States has the resolve um, to fight those types of wars. So I don't think it would be a smart idea for the US and, and other countries to change their policies to a new status quo that China and no, cannot live with and therefore would fight to the very end to reverse. That is, that is not a China we can win a war against. 
Oriana, could I play devil's advocate here for a moment? Sure. Um, China's economy and its economic growth over the last three, four decades, which has been remarkable, has been based on full-blooded participation in the global capitalist economy, including very important markets like the United States, the EU, and Japan. If those three countries signaled in a concerted fashion that they would move towards the sort of policy that's been asked here by our questioner, do you think that would give them pause to, th uh, to think or thought in, in, in China, in Beijing? Because let's face it, um, the Chinese political legitimacy depends on its economic growth. And if they were confronted by this sort of concerted opposition, which looks unlikely in the form of this uh, coordinated to China policy that's being raised, surely it would actually raise big questions for the Chinese leadership in terms of their political legitimacy at home. Put at risk, in other words, the sort of economic progress that has enabled China uh, to grow so rapidly. So I think the premise of the question is, is, is correct, right? China's economy, I think most of 65%, 70% of their trade is with the United States and US allies and partners. And so it's definitely the case that they have prioritized um, having positive relations with the United States and its allies and partners for primarily this reason. The question is what would deter China from using force? And uh, for deterrence to work, you have to have a credible threat, but you also have to have credible reassurance. If China thinks the world is going in a direction no matter what it does, that also doesn't necessarily shape its behavior. So if we could signal to China sort of an if-then statement, if they used force against Taiwan, you know, then we would economically decouple. And if, if you want to take it to the extreme, then support you know, Taiwan independence. That's one thing. But I think it really has to be premised on the if. I've personally, I testified um, for a congressional commission back in February. And, and I argue against, even in that scenario, saying we would support Taiwan independence primarily for the for the reasons I laid out. I think we get ourselves into a war that's, that's really hard to win. And that's very difficult. If a war has occurred, even if the United States wins, it's not really the policy of the US to uh, go back to the status quo. Uh, we don't like to lose blood and treasure to just go back to the way things were, but that's really what we have to wrap our heads around if we want peace and stability as quickly as possible. So the premise of the argument is absolutely correct. If China felt like its economic growth were to be threatened, that would be a great deterrent. Um, but when states choose between sort of vital security interests and their economies, they always choose vital security interests. Um, so we don't wanna make it so that's the choice. Um, we wanna make the economic pain you know, predicated on Chinese behavior. Thank you, Oriana. Any any other further comments to the members of the panel on that question? I'm good. Okay, let's move to another question that's been mooted, and I, I think this applies to all panel members. The, this question is, the world, including New Zealand, has done nothing about China's actions in Hong Kong and East uh, Turkestan, Zhejiang. If China did take Taiwan by force, do you believe there will be any real consequences for China other than a hollow world, uh, hollow words of protest. Would the panel like to comment on this? Can I show? Sure, I'll, I'll take a stab sure. quickly. I mean, the first part of the question, you know, if you did ask certain world leaders, they would say, well, look, we have voiced protest. Um, they might also say, but what do you expect us to do for a range of constraints we face, a range of trading reason, trade, trading issues we face, but they would say they've taken at least rhetorical action, which I know for a lot of us probably may not feel like it's enough. On the second part, um, if China did take Taiwan by force, so okay, if that's the premise, do you believe there would be any real consequences? Um, I think there would be consequences here. I think that is, especially if it was in the near term, given um, the state of in the Indo-Pacific order, so to speak, and the fact that most countries would view that very negatively and see that as a very bad precedent. Would the consequence be military? I don't think so, probably. And I think Oriana kind of alluded to this. I mean, China has certain weaponry, nuclear weapons, that it could use in some way to indicate that, look, hey, this could escalate a nuclear war. And the rest of the world probably would not military intervene after the fact if they conquered Taiwan. Um, but look, I think that is something that could draw a line for a lot of countries. That could lead to trade repercussions, that could lead to sanctions, that could lead to all sorts of costs that the region might come together to, to 
impose on China, a bit like how Russia found out you can't just annex Crimea without the Europeans and other countries placing serious sanctions on you and so on. So that, that's my, my guess. Zhang would like to comment. Yep. Well, I think uh, in this issue, uh, of course, there would be some, some consequences, but if you, we, we have to consider whether the consequences are you know, big enough for China to, to, to deter from you know, uh, invading Taiwan and take Taiwan by force. And up to now, I believe that uh, the calculation from Beijing is that the, the consequences are big enough for not to take Taiwan by force right now, but we are not so sure about the future because Taiwan is, of course, is the, 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 the center of uh, uh, the link and the, the center of uh, East Asia uh, supply chains and play a critically important role in, uh, in the global economy, especially given its capacity to produce um, uh, a lot of high-tech uh, equipment uh, for the world. So I think that that, that is the, uh, the reason why we, we might not see uh, you know, in near term uh, what uh, China would take Taiwan by force, but we never sure in the future because there might be some more, uh, more reason for, for China to take action rather than that purely economic reasons. And you know, that's what we, we might see uh, in, um, you know, in the future. Just before moving on to two, could I just ask you, reflecting on your, your answer, Sheng, um, do you think what would deter China from, or what would, if you like, make Taiwan put it on a long-term footing? There's been a lot of discussion. Uh, Ariane mentioned in her foreign affairs article that she feels that the timetable was moved forward for the false option uh, for the Chinese leadership in relation to Taiwan. What do you think would put it back? What would, if you like, um, um, have some sort of impact on the Chinese leadership? I mean, like, like, like what uh, uh, Roman already said, it, it's about how other uh, great powers, especially US, would respond to such a military uh, invasion of Taiwan by China. I, and I would think that by now, if we uh, look at how how you know how desire uh, the political leaders in Beijing want to take Taiwan because it's you know a, the dream of every Chinese leaders as seen Mao Zedong. Uh, so uh, they 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 know that uh, the consequences ex is including economic sanctions and you know isolation from the world would be huge enough for them not to take action by now. But of course, it's, uh, the, the the problem of Taiwan relates much to the you know uh, nationalism in China as well. So when you talk about nationalism, mm. it's Sometimes it's irrational, so you know, mm. maybe some some uh, black swan event might happen, but I would I would not think that would happen in the near term. Let's bring in two. Any any thoughts on this question too, about this uh, the question that we've just asked about uh, um, China and Taiwan. Doctor. Oh, Hong? sorry. You yeah, yeah. Sorry, Doctor Hong. Hong is my first. Sorry, I didn't realize. The other day. I'm sorry. Um, so, uh, look, the Taiwan debate is very, very intense here in Australia at the moment. Um, uh, almost all of, uh, all of you know, sudden, all, all of nowhere. I think it's um, a really become an issue and discussion in the serious uh, considerations and scenario building, not here, only here in Australia, but across elsewhere, including in the most recent um, defense. Uh, paper in, uh, in Japan as well. So and and the discussion within Taiwan as well. There's has always been, you know, the most undesirable scenario somewhere back in their mind. But I live in Taiwan for se seven years, and I, when I talk to my colleagues and friends in in Taiwan, um, I think in the beginning of when this debate resurfaced, I thought it was very unhelpful in the way we frame it because there's so many. Obviously, that would be the least desired scenario, but we're not helping that by just framing who would jump in and who would jump uh, would not. I think for to support Taiwan, there's so many other ways. Um, in the meantime, including uh, the most most desired by Taiwan, the FTAs with number of countries, including with the US, Australia, and a number of countries. So you know, I think. We are getting ahead of, of the problem a little bit. Of course, it is a challenge. It's much more palatable now these days than it used to be before. But I think the way the problem is framed, uh, especially by external actors, is too much either war or not war, and, and there's too black, too black and white, too much, too end, and nothing in between. Which for the Taiwanese themselves, I think, is not very helpful. Thank you. Just while we're on the. Um, Taiwan issue, and uh, this is a question for Ariana. 
Um, aside from historical claims over territory, could you please flesh out why China would want to militarily assert control over Taiwan, considering the significant economic political costs uh, uh, which it would entail? So I think the first thing is that there is a debate about what those political and economic costs would be. Um, I think this was a previous question about the international community's response to Hong Kong. Um, China's foreign policy over the past 25 years has been premised on convincing countries that Taiwan is a unique situation. Uh, they have strategic partnerships with most of U.S. allies and partners, and there's a, a provision in all of those that basically highlights this point. And I've heard very high level, cabinet level prime ministers echo this talking point throughout the region. And so I, I'm not 100% sure the political and economic costs would be so significant. Um, it was mentioned, you know, that the majority of the semiconductor industry is on the island of Taiwan. I think the Chinese could very quickly take Taiwan. So if it's a short war, the, you know, and I've seen some Chinese writings that suggest they could do it in a matter of hours, like 100 hours. Um, some reincorporation war games have put it more at a couple of days, um, and, and in some cases a few weeks. But uh, then the military costs also are, are not particularly high. So the question is, you know, what does the Chinese leadership think of all of this? And I think, you know, they see that it's, it's potential. There's a potential for the cost not to be as high, and then they have all sorts of benefits, right? First of all they don't have to dedicate so many resources to the Taiwan issue. I mean, beyond the military modernization, which is all directed towards dealing you know, with Taiwan primarily, of course, there's also the South China Sea issue, but Taiwan primarily. And then there's also the foreign policy efforts. You know, think of how much effort it takes to be monitoring, you know, how Taiwan is depicted in movies and TV shows and who is saying what on Twitter. I mean, they waste so much of their power dealing with this issue. So if they were freed up um, and not to even mention having Taiwan as a military base that allows them to basically hold the United States military hostage in the second island chain, which has never been a possibility really before. Uh, and then if they control the semiconductor industry, they'll basically go to the rest of the world and say, we're open for business, right? Taiwan has always been a part of China from China's perspective. Taiwan is still a part of China from China's perspective. Uh, do you want your cell phones and your cars or not? So I think it's very debatable whether or not these costs are high. That's why when people ask, you know, what would happen, the United States would absolutely fight to defend Taiwan. I am very confident in that. The, the big question is whether or not the United States can win. And one of the issues is it takes the United States a long time to amass its forces and, and time is something we don't have. Now, luckily there's been some recent changes in how the United States fight, fights wars. Um, I'm part of a, a, a something uh, called the Global Information Dominance Experiments. The military loves its acronyms um, in, in which um, there should be a press conference about this in about a week or two. But the main premise is that the United States is gonna get really good at moving assets really quickly around the world. Uh, a lot more quickly than we're used to doing it. So this is the type of thing that would deter, deter China. If they don't think they can take Taiwan, a fait accompli before the United States can move, they know that then they'll lose. So I think we have to demonstrate to China not only that the aftermath would be costly, because I think that's hard because it might not be, but that they cannot succeed, that we can physically stop them. And by we, I mean, you know, the United States, that the United States can stop them. As much as I know President Biden is trying to reinvigorate the alliances, you know, I'm with the other panelists. We, the economic, free trade, political ties, all of that is so important. Uh, we, we have to move beyond this idea that allies have to do the same stuff. You know, just because the United States says FONOPS doesn't mean everyone has to do FONOPS. We all have different comparative advantages. We all have different national security interests. The main thing is that we're coordinating what we're doing to achieve mutual objectives. And so, you know, what are different, unique, and innovative ways that the United States and, and New Zealand can work together to promote peace and security in the region um, that we haven't done before. I think that's where the focus should be. Thank you, Oriana. And then we come on to a, <clears throat> a question which overlaps with Taiwan, but is really to do with, I think, US, um, how should I put it, the credibility of the US position in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, Dr. Kerm, uh, Kirk Campbell, who addressed us this morning, said in his presentation that the ultimate US goal in the Pacific region is, quote, peace and security with stability being sought. It was uh, not seeking, um, in other words, Mr. Dr. Campbell was saying that the United States was position was of status quo power. Um, if China did take military action against Taiwan or perhaps crack down further uh, in Hong Kong or took 
um, even more repressive actions against the Uyghurs, how realistic would be um, that the US would actually intervene? Um, now, clearly, we'd have to make a distinction between those different scenarios that I just outlined. Um, I think it would be difficult for the United States to take military action for something occurring within China. But on the other issues, uh, Taiwan and Hong Kong, um, I, I'd like to go around the panel and find out what they think in response to this question. Because Dr. Campbell did say in his nuanced presentation this morning that while the United States uh, wanted to take coordinated action in curbing some of the actions that China's engaged in, he also said that the United States has a major domestic problem at the moment, uh, the polarization with the United States society. So how do we weigh the domestic circumstances and how they impinge on America's foreign policy at the moment? So this question really begins to make inroads into that. So I'd be very interested to hear from all our panelists on this question. Could I start off with you, Shane? Yeah, sure. Uh at first, uh, I, I think we should uh, go back to uh, U.S. very long policy of strategic ambiguity over Taiwan. So Taiwan is not a treaty ally of, of the U.S., uh, basically. And also, they also state that if Taiwan like, claims independence by itself, and then if something happened, you know, the Chinese would say that if, if Taiwan claims independence, there would be some military consequences of that. And so in, in that case, I would say, I would think that it really depends on different scenarios of, you know, what uh, leads to the military intervention from China to Taiwan. And so, uh, but in my opinion, see, uh, even in, 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 uh, in different scenarios, uh, the likelihood of the US intervention in Taiwan would be, I think would be quite minimal, given that it's not a treaty ally. And given what we've seen in the uh, Scarborough shown in 2012, for example, at that time, Kurt Cabo was the coordinator of, of you know, uh, uh, you know, of negotiation between the Philippines and and, the, uh, and China, and then this uh, when the Chinese re reneged on the the promise of leaving Scarborough Shoal, uh, when the Philippines did so, then there was no consequences, and Philippines was a treaty ally, and we look at the the case of Georgia uh, in 2008, for example, and that was just the same thing. I, I think the U.S. would have to would would consider a lot, you know, can calculate a lot on you know, the the risks and the. The, the military cost and economic cost of, in, uh, you know, of having some military actions if something happened in Taiwan. And I would say in, you know, in most of the scenarios, uh, the likelihood of U.S. intervention uh, in such case is very minimal. Ruben. Yeah, I'll, I'll just make a brief comment on the domestic side of things. Yeah, uh, Biden, uh, and this goes back to Trump, the, sorry, Obama. For quite a long time, the Americans have been saying we really need to focus on nation building at home once we get our affairs in a bit more order, then perhaps we have more scope for foreign policy. But the Americans are pretty heavily engaged in big swaths of the world, irrespective of their domestic mm. problems. And even under, a, under Biden, sorry, where we're hearing the same signal, hey, hey, hey world, we're getting our affairs in order. I still feel like the American, the global presence is still pretty heavy. I mean, they're globally positioned, whether it's the military, global investment interests, economic interests. Um, so I don't know to what degree the domestic part would prevent America if they wanted to somehow take action, intervene, if Taiwan was threatened. Uh, maybe Oriana has some thoughts upon whether domestic politics would constrain that in any fashion or not. Um, and look, I think, I guess I would tend to think that if there was in the near term a military explosion in the Taiwan Straits between China and Taiwan or an invasion, the likelihood of American intervention would be pretty low, but I could also imagine a certain scenario where the Americans say to themselves, either we stop them now or maybe we don't stop them for a while. You know, like mm. a bit like what happened in World War II and the lead up to that, there were certain times where France and Great Britain could have probably stopped the Nazi juggernaut before it fully came to power in 1939 or fully was able to uh, conquer territories around it without any fight you know, coming back at it. I could imagine a domestic political situation in the US where it is now we need to take action or else, you know, or else this is, this is a bad signal to the entire world that the, the rules-based system we claim to protect and uphold, we are not necessarily going to come to the aid of nations when they are screaming for it, kind of. So I could imagine that. I think, I don't, I wouldn't bet on that, but that I could imagine that outcome. Thanks, Ruben. Oriana, what's your thoughts on this question? Yeah, the United States is absolutely going to fight this war. 
like a hundred percent is absolutely going to do it. it democrats republicans and and you know uh, you know, Kurt is absolutely, you know, correct that there are some divisions in U.S. society, but those divisions are not about national security. Um, you know, I myself am a Democrat, but I have a think tank home at the American Enterprise Institute, which is a very conservative think tank. And that's largely because, you know, when it comes to defending U.S. interests in the world, we're all on the same page. Now, you know, if you look at President Obama's national security strategy, you know, he that still wanted, you know, U.S. Uh, to maintain the U.S. role in the world. Now, President Obama and President Trump had different views of that. President Biden have different views of that as well. But I wouldn't take the lack of U.S. response over the past two decades as a sign of future lack of response. I would take it as the opposite. This is like, you know, a Poisson equation. The longer you poke the bear and the bear doesn't wake up, the more likely you are to get this aggressive response. I think that's where the US domestic public is. And just as a side note, historically, any war that the United States has fought, you, you always have like 70% of US domestic support in the early days. Now, that support changes over time depending on how the war goes. And, Interestingly, women tend to, to lose support for the war more quickly than men. There's a lot of interesting things about this. But initially, the American public is, is fully on board. You know, Chinese colleagues always complain to me of how belligerent the United States is. And my response is always, you know, then what are you doing? What are you doing? If you think the United States is looking for an excuse to fight a war, man, China has given the United States so, so many excuses. So it's absolutely the case that the United States just wants peace and stability in the region, but it also, peace and stability from the perspective, I think, of the US government is the US role in Asia has to, has to be strong. Because it maybe it's from World War II, but there is this viewpoint that when the United States is not present, that's when things get bad. That's why we have a global military presence. And so China wants the US military out of the region. The United States is not willing to leave. This is a broader part of the competition. And so whether it's over Taiwan or South China Sea, I think what you'll see is the United States does feel like you know, it has to hold its ground and it's learned its lesson. It reached out an olive branch to China and China took advantage. Uh, and now you see a much more forceful United States that is embracing great power competition and is gearing up to ensure that um, we can deter China, but if necessary, defeat China in a conflict. So, so I don't think we're dealing with the United States of a couple of years ago um, and going to the point of, you know, now's the time whether New Zealand or Australia to think about these contingencies. Uh, I think these are very real scenarios that you might see a limited conflict in the region. And so I'd very strongly urge people to think about you know, what that means um, for the various countries and politics in the region. Thanks, Oriana. Chu, any questions, any comments you'd like to add on, in response to this question? Oh, my name is Huang. Um, sorry, I think I'm not in a position to really comment on US domestic uh, politics. I think um, Oriana has, has reaffirmed if there's contingency about Taiwan, but I think in your question was also Hong Kong and Xinjiang and whatnot. And I, I am not that convinced that that would be really the case. And um, I think from, from regional perspective, from Southeast Asian regional perspective, I think there is a lot of question mark. And we just had um, the fifth anniversary of the 2016 uh, betrayal tribunal ruling um, of the Philippines against China. And um, US has reaffirmed, um, using this occasion to reaffirm uh, US commitment of the mutual defense treaty with the Philippines. So I think there is this, this need in the region for US to constantly reaffirm its commitment, even if it's you know um, signed by the legal uh, obligations, which are really only Philippines got with, with the US in, in that kind of um, arrangement. In the other scenarios, other than that um, Ariana has uh, painted, I'm not so sure. Um, and I'm not so sure, I mean, it really depends on the scenario. I don't think, you know, Xinjiang and uh, and Hong Kong would, would spark um, a, a conflict that other actors in the region would um, follow and support. I think at the moment, even rhetorically and uh, uh, diplomatically, there is, uh, US is having a hard time convincing rhetoric, rhetorically um, the region to support, you know, this vision of democracies versus autocracies. I think we haven't agreed on that yet. And if you look again from the Southeast Asian regional perspective, 
we have a situation happening in, in Myanmar uh, where a legitimate government and legitimately re-elected in November last year has been um, uh, arrested and uh, replaced by military coup and uh, you know um, legitimate members of the government as well as civil society are being held um, um, in, in, under arrest and there is a civil war happening. No one is doing anything about it. Um, because Southeast Asia is bound by that non-interference principle. So if, you, if your question refers to Hong Kong, Xinjiang, I don't think there would be a ready support from region uh, just because, of, again, uh, by that very much principle of non-interference. I don't, it really depends on the scenario and perhaps the Taiwan scenario, the way um, Oriana depicted might be a, a different case. But in general, I think Southeast Asian would be very hesitant to to support um, uh, any kind of intervention. Thanks, too. Um, <clears throat> so far, most of our questions have uh, focused on, if you like, uh, geopolitical aspects. And I think it's, it's we've got a question here on climate change, uh, which I think is very much in the, the human security category. Um, so I'd and it, I think all members of the panel should comment on this question. With climate change acting as a threat multiplier, how will states in the Indo-Pacific meet their population security needs? And what implications might this have on the stability of governing institutions? Could I start with you, James? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, if, if, you, if you look at the name of the Indo-Pacific region, the name speaks for itself that uh, there is a region that would be the most vulnerable uh, uh, facing uh, you know, the risk of climate change uh, issues. And I think given the fact that uh, all of the uh, countries in nations, uh, in Southeast Asian uh, nations are uh, developing countries and they face uh, different you know, uh, needs in, you know, in terms of uh, other, uh, other security needs, like food security, for example, uh, they don't really have a lot of capacity to deal with uh, climate change. And in, additionally, uh, because climate change should be seen as a transnational issue, uh, which require the cooperation of countries across the region, especially via ASEAN, because they uphold the principle of ASEAN centrality. Uh, but if we look at the, the way that ASEAN works uh, so far, it's very passive, and it requires uh, you know, a total amount of consensus, which is very difficult you know, in solving the pressing issues. Uh, I recall in some, some ASEAN uh, meetings when some countries want to uh, raise the issue of the, uh, the dams across the Mekong River, which affects, uh, greatly affects countries like Cambodia, Vietnam, and Laos. But other countries say that because it only affects like three or four countries, it's not a regional issue. On the other conferences uh, uh, of ASEAN, when uh, countries like Vietnam or Philippines want to raise this, the problem of South, South China Sea issue, and then even though they have, uh, there, there are a lot of claimant states uh, which are members of ASEAN, uh, um, they, some countries like Cambodia, for example, still comments that it's not a regional issue because it only affects like a few states, not the whole state. So if, if we see that in, in, in that way that ASEAN actually uh, has really failed to address this transnational issue, especially when it requires uh, much more proactive uh, cooperation, so in this sense, uh, it's really, uh, we really need to, especially countries are, are close to the region like Australia and New Zealand, really need to, to uh, provide much more uh, support in order to improve the governance capacity of ASEAN, uh, and in the long term probably to provide uh, capacity building and to improve uh, the uh, ability of ASEAN as a central uh, institution to deal with uh, the risk of uh, climate change issues in, in the region. Thank you, Jane. Ruben. Yeah, look, I'd just second that. I mean, this is going to, climate change is going to affect some nations much more than others, and especially the ones that right now that don't have great capacity to, to, to deal with the problems that are coming. So, you know, if we're worried about climate refugees, it seems incumbent upon the, the you know, wealthier states of the Indo Pacific to be helping out those ones that um, have the least amount of capacity to deal with the problem. Otherwise, in the future, there's going to be millions of climate refugees flooding out of certain parts of the Indo-Pacific into other nations, right? This is an interconnected problem. It's not a problem any one nation, you know, you can't just put up your borders. Generally, you can't just put up your borders and keep people out. Um, so I just echo what I heard um, a second ago, that we, we need to do our best to help out technologically, economically, on infrastructure, um, and whatever we can provide. 
Good. Thank you, Ruben. Can I bring Oriana in, please? Your thoughts on this question? Yeah, you know, this isn't really my area of expertise, but I will say that, you know, from the military perspective, you know, climate change is a significant issue. Territory and, and need for limited resources have caused 80% of wars since the 1600s. And so it makes sense to think that as um, climate change impacts the environment around us, this could also impact propensity for conflicts and where conflicts might break out. So uh, maybe perhaps like the China challenge, this is something that now we're talking about more and more, but uh, you know, governments haven't taken uh, seriously enough and it really has to reach such a stage of severity before we wake up to the challenge. But I think also just, you know, the way to think about it is that these, I don't think great power competition and dealing with a lot of these human security, climate change, what we call non-traditional military issues, don't go hand in hand. Um, in many ways, uh, the same ways that we could address some of the non-traditional security issues would also help the United States in a great power competition to allow for the establishment and maintenance of an international order that is, is conducive um, to the values of, of the United States to New Zealand and, and to other allies and partners. Um, so, uh, you know, this isn't something that I've looked at very deeply, uh, but it is something I'm very supportive uh, in case others have looked at it very deeply and I appreciate the question. Thank you. Uh, Chu, any comments on this question? Could you repeat the question, please? Yes, certainly. Um, where I can find it. Um, oh. Climate change. Essentially, the question is, uh, was um, about to what extent, here, me the, oh, here we go, with climate change acting as a threat multiplier, how will states in the Indo-Pacific meet their population security needs and what implications might this have on the stability of governing institutions? Yeah, I think that's a really uh, big challenge and long-term challenge going ahead and certainly not one challenge of a one administration is going to be a continuous one. And COVID uh, will also um, make the things worse. I think the resources will be um, more scarce and I think um, already um, great power competition or competition in general is about resources as well and resource management. I think. Um, the Mekong case was was erased uh, by uh, Zhang, uh, but this is something that you know China, as a big and populous country, will have have engaged into and in securing resources for for its own um, country and population, whereas uh, countries around um, uh, have less capacity to do that. And I think that would could trigger certain um, tension and certain co competition in the region. Uh, in um, in regards of resources. Um, it could be um, from natural resources, but uh, also um, uh, the ability to exploit uh, um, fisheries, uh, oil and gas in offshore, in South China Sea in particular, but also um, um, beyond, which also um, kind of overlaps with the, uh, the territorial disputes. With, um, I think, uh, that, that comes a question of climate change and climate management, because this is also a long term and impact on that. And um, one of the findings that I've, um, I've highlighted in, in my research about the COVID impact is also that uh, governments will, could tend to, you know, um, put off uh, certain objectives, including um, ta climate targets uh, put forward because of the uh, of pandemic urgency and um, because of the resources, including um, monetary resources, but also human resources and state capacity resources to deal with the pandemic. Um, with the all range countries have um, put in their own um, uh, stimulus packages so both uh, you know monetary and um, uh, other resources are being put into dealing with pandemic the resources that could have gone or would originally be to address climate uh, issues um, uh, are being uh, often compromised because of the short-term urgency at the moment um, so overall the, the impact of COVID could also affect uh, the state 
capacities to deal with those issues. And I think the post-COVID world will be a much more uh, unstable one where resources uh, will be scarce and there will be a more uh, intensified competition uh, for them in the region. Thank you. Um, we have a question here which uh, is, mentions my name, but I'm going to throw it open. I'm, I'm going to give some comments. Um, but I'm also going to invite the rest of the panel. Um, the, the question is as follows. Dr. Patman, please speak to New Zealand capacity and place to mediate in any conflict between China and the US. This issue of mediation actually appeared in the, China, uh, in the uh, Otago Foreign Policy School last week. It also came up there. Does New Zealand have a role in mediating? And the, the question asked in a supplementary, what would we need to develop this capacity? My first reaction to this question um, would be that I'm not sure as a pluralist democracy and a country which takes human rights very seriously as the Prime Minister outlined today and a, a, a country which uh, has an independent foreign policy, I'm not sure that New Zealand would actually, uh, it, New Zealand wants to retain the capacity to be both critical of New Zealand's foreign policy but also supportive of it. And that balancing act I think could be compromised if it tried to mediate between an authoritarian system and also um, a, a liberal democracy like the United States. And you know, the supplementary to this, what would we need, that is what would New Zealand need to develop this capacity? Well, I think New Zealand would probably, if it was going to be a, 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 a credible mediator between the United States and China, would have to start dumbing down on some of its core values and interests. It would have to be seen as non-aligned and it would have to be seen as, um, I think, uh, retreating on some of the issues um, that we actually want to see extended, such as an international rules-based system. So uh, that's my, my take on it, but let's throw this open to the panel. We're, we're fighting time, so I think this will be our final round, so to speak. So could I start with you, Shane, please? Yeah, I, I would say that uh, the, the, other, the other way of thinking about this question is, like, why would New Zealand want to do so? And uh, I mean, like, if, if we look at the, uh, the, the reason, uh, you know, um, tension between Australia and, and, uh, uh, and China earlier this year when uh, New Zealand offered to be meditate between, you know, Australia and, 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 and China, there was some, you know, pushback from, real strong pushback from, from China itself. Uh, and uh, secondly, we, if, if New, New Zealand really wants to do so, uh, probably uh, we need to look at other role models of uh, mediations like uh, Norway, some, some Scandinavian countries like Norway or Denmark, and uh, maybe to some extent recently probably Qatar or Singapore. But like, I would agree with you that you know, in order to be uh, a really you know, uh, impartial mediator, you need to, to you know, drop you know, some key values of, of, of New Zealand as a liberal democracy, and that would not be you know, a really a, a good prospect uh, for New Zealand to be. Thank you. Ruben. Yeah, thanks, Robert. Um, look, a few other people have thrown this out there. I've thrown it out there before amongst the, uh, a number of other proposals when I've been at my most idealistic. Um, I think mediate is probably a more active and strong word. I mean, how I would envisage this if it ever came into any into being would not be us sitting them down and saying, okay, okay, now China, China, what, what do you have to say to America? And playing a, an active role, but to say, look, if you want a table to sit at, if you want to be in a country that is good enough, has good enough relations with both of you and want a, a forum, we could, a bit like Singapore, some other nation mm. has done in recent years, offer simply a place for you to sit and talk if you wanted to. Now, the last time that, well, that happened in Alaska recently, and the Americans and Chinese didn't, didn't work out very well, but yeah, I, I wouldn't overread the word mediate too much into this. Um, yeah, capacity, well, um, we've just heard you'd want to look at other countries. You're then talking about conflict resolution capacity building, an MFAT, for example, or something. But uh, yeah, I, I think mediate is a bit of a strong word, offering a, a neutral location to meet, or a neutral enough location to meet would be perhaps the most we could throw out there. And ultimately, it's going to be up to them whether they want to come or not. We can't entice them. They just they don't want it. They just say no, and that's it. Okay, thanks, Ruben. Ariana, quick comments on this question about whether New Zealand could actually mediate in the conflict between the, or the tensions between the United States and China. Any thoughts, well, please? You know, I'm I'm much more, uh, I guess, a student of New Zealand politics than an, an expert in this. The question I would have is, 
Is that the role New Zealand wants? Is New Zealand really neutral in, in terms of how this competition turns out? Now, my view of national security and, and how it's been defined by scholars and practitioners alike has been the desire to be free from foreign dictation. Now, obviously, depending on country sizes, there's always a degree to which foreign powers are going to influence New Zealand policy, what New Zealand can do. The question is, you know, does the United States and China try to do that to the same degree in the same way? Would the world from New Zealand's perspective be just as good with the United States more powerful than China or with China more powerful than the United States? If that's the case and, and, and it really is a, sort of a neutral position that New Zealand has of how this great power competition unfolds, then I think all these responses and this idea of serving as this um, sort of neutral ground is, is a great way forward. If, on the other hand, um, for the sake of New Zealand's own national interests, there is a stake in seeing the United States succeed um, and that the foreign dictation coming from the United States uh, can be uh, not great, but better than the foreign dictation that we would expect from China, then perhaps uh, a strategy of pure neutral mediation would not be the way to go. But again, uh, that is obviously uh, for New Zealand to decide. Thanks, Oriana. We're, we're fighting the clock, Chu. Any, any final thoughts on this question of a possible mediation role between New Zealand and the United States and China? Um, yeah, I think some smaller countries uh, have proven in the history to be very successful in playing that role. Uh, look, Singapore with late Lee Kuan Yew, but you do need some sort of uh, personality like that to be able to mediate the big guys. But the key key um, uh, factor, other than whether it's the New Zealand wants to do it or not, is you know, whether the big guys want to come to the table. Because, for example, uh, Singapore and Vietnam wanted to mediate between Trump and Kim, but when they walk away from the table, there was not much to uh, mediate. So the key is really, you know, there it must be some sort of at least political will from both sides to come and, and talk and have that uh, being at the same table. And this is something that smaller countries such as New Zealand, but also many ASEAN countries have have uh, done before and successfully done so before. So really, uh, you know, for now, I think Finland is in the position to foster that environment uh, and expectation, um, you know, if, if that's what it wants to encourage um, US and China to talk. But if they don't want to talk, nobody's going to come to the table and there's no, no mediation to be happening. Just like Kim and Trump walk away from the tables. Thank you, too. I just, it just remains for me to express a few words of gratitude to our four speakers, who I think uh, have been excellent. And thank you to the audience for your many fine questions. Sorry we couldn't answer all of them, but please show your appreciation for our four fine speakers. Thank you.